Hi there, welcome back to J300. Today we're gonna to deliver a lecture uh, that's pulled right out of your textbook from the non-designers design book. And um, we're gonna take um, a lot of what Williams writes about uh, design theory and how she breaks it into four groups here. She calls it uh, C-A-R-P. Uh, we are gonna call our lecture that as well. And uh, we're gonna talk about what makes effective design and what makes um, design not work. And uh, this will be, again, really useful for um, your exam that's coming up in a couple weeks here. And especially because we're gonna talk about the difference between your taste, what you like and what you don't like, and what is effective design, which might be things uh, that you, know, you don't necessarily uh, like you don't maybe like a font or the way that it's used, but you think it is effective in terms of communicating what it's trying to communicate. So um, I think that we, from the beginning of this semester, have been talking about things that we like and don't like, whether, whether it was the first day of class when we were talking about brands that we admire and the way that they're designed. And so I think a lot of the times we're, when we're talking about that, we're talking about our personal taste, right? We talk about um, things that are designed in an ugly way and things that are really, really not palatable to look at. And um, there are a couple of different things that we can talk about in terms of this, right? Um, we can think about things that are kind of ugly to look at, but at the same time, they work in speaking to a specific audience. And I think that we have um, in our minds a whole bunch of websites that we think, oh, they're incredibly, incredibly ugly to look at, but they're wildly popular for whatever reason they are. And the first one that we're going to talk about today is this one, the Drudge Report. And it's at thedrudgereport.com. So let's go take a look at what a page from the Drudge Report looks like. All right, so welcome to the Drudge Report. Uh, if you have never visited this website before, this is going to be it's going to be quite a trip for you. Yes, this is exactly what this website is supposed to look like. Uh, this is a news aggregation website where uh, Matt Drudge of late 90s, early 2000s fame has um, aggregated all kinds of news from all over the world. And like I said, this is, <laughs> this is what it's supposed to look like. This is not uh, some sort of loading error or something like that. Uh, and here is your uh, top news stories up at the top left. And here is uh, your centerpiece news story. And then here are some other ones before aggregating some um, headlines down below here. And um, I think we can look at this and say, holy cow, this has some incredible uh, design <laughs> hurdles to get over, but yet it persists. It, it, uh, it keeps going and going uh, as the Drudge Report. And what are the things that if like uh, your friend pulled this up and said, hey, I created a new blog, I think it's going to be really, really popular with all of uh, college students, you would say, um, you need to work on what? What are the things that are problematic about this website. Uh, you should be able to give this a critique, right? We should be able to take a look at it and say, here's what we uh, here's what we think about it. And I think one of the things that is so useful about Williams' uh, creation of CARP is that if you look at this, a lot of the problems that we have with our this website are problems of contrast. There's not enough contrast in this huge mess of type over here at the left. There's not there's big problems of alignment, right? For instance, why are we centering all of this stuff um, in the middle and allowing all of this vacuous white space to sit in the middle of the page? We have problems of repetition. In other words, um, the only thing that's really repeated on here is the idea that this text is going to be um, is going to be uh, you know laid out in this particular way. We're not going to have similarly sized photos or anything like that. It is a problem of proximity for sure. For instance, the idea that all of these headlines look like they belong together and that they have absolutely nothing to do with the Trump headline in the middle here. So we've got proximity problems as well. So a lot of what we are, are going to talk about in this lecture, we can see in uh, this one page. And yet, 
he says. And yet, if you look at the traffic for this website, look at this. Down here, they said in the last 30 to 24 hours, they have had more than 30 million visitors, creeping up on 31 million visitors. They have had a, a what? is that that is a billion visitors in the past 31 days and 10 billion in the last year if you would like to believe all of their uh all of their st internal statistics here so that's an incredible amount of visitors so even though we see all of these design problems we can still say that it is a wildly wildly popular website uh, against all of our design uh feelings and hang-ups Maybe the first example of the website that you thought of was Craigslist, which is an incredibly effective website that has um, you know, some design flaws that we can look at. So if you looked at this page, if I asked you to critique this page, what would you say about why this is um, not a particularly enticing um, thing to look at, that it's not very visually attractive? Break it down for me. What would you say about its use of typography, about its use of color, about its use of what uh, Williams calls C-A-R-P? We'll talk about what those mean. But if you can pull from your reading and think, what are those things um, that could be done much better here? This would, again, be a really good um, question for your exam is to look at this page and critique how it could be better. Now, obviously, Craigslist is wildly, wildly popular still, right? P people post you know, thousands of items to it in major metropolitan areas every single day. And um, that design problem, that thing that we're seeing that we don't like the design of, maybe that makes it still okay. Right? Why would we be okay with it looking, uh, you know, not so pretty? Well, first of all, it's not trying to sell you anything, right? Craigslist is uh, not making money off of you uh, posting up your cabinet, right? It only makes um, money off off of certain kinds of postings, and so it's just trying to be useful. It's not trying to be um, attractive in that way, right? We also know when we see it, not just from websites, we can see, uh, we can recognize ugly almost immediately. So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna show you a pair of newspaper pages, and these were redesigned about 10 years ago. And on one side of the screen, you're gonna see the old, the older, the pre the pre-redesigned page, and then on the other side of the screen, you're gonna see um, the redesigned one. And almost immediately, you can spot the one that has been redesigned. So let's give it a shot here from a uh, familiar newspaper to many of you, which is the Kansas City Star. Which one of these is the redesigned one? Is it the one on the left or the one on the right? Almost immediately, most of you would say that the one on the left was redesigned. Well, what about it makes it look more timely? What about it makes it look more current? And what about it makes it more effective design? There are a lot of things that I could see in this page that would make point me to that. What about this one? Which one of these was redesigned? To me, it's pretty obvious that it's the one on the right, that it is more effectively designed. What about this pairing right here? Was the left one before or the right one before? Well, obviously the left-hand one was the after um, look here. So what was it about these pages? What was it about them that made it more obvious made it obvious to us that they were the redesigned version. So let's look at some of the things that, um, that we're talking about. If we know ugly when we see it, how can we talk about you know, aesthetically interesting and good page design um, in terms of a, a few different uh, theories or principles, right? So these are the principles that we're gonna talk about. These are the ones that Williams puts out there for us in her text. She calls them C-A-R-P. We can call them contrast, alignment, repetition, and proximity. Now, one of the things that's really good about this lecture that I like about delivering it before the test is it's repeating a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about early in the semester. We've talked about contrast, we've talked about typography, the idea that we don't want to have 
conflicting fonts, we want to have contrasting fonts. We've talked about alignment already when we talked about typography alignment and we talked about use of space. We've talked about repetition before in photography when we talked about this idea of repetition being broken and we talked about proximity when we were talking about the gestalt ideas of grouping. So what we're doing here in this lecture, just to be really clear, is we're taking lots and lots of ideas from different parts of our semester and we're trying to put them together with um, the way that Williams would like you to think about them and maybe a way that will make more sense for you when you're critiquing uh, designs out there too. So anyway, C-A-R-P. The first one that we're going to talk about today is contrast. You might be able to see the light uh, letter C in the background there contrasted with the very, very dark wording and heavy weight of the black contrast um, that seems to be kind of in front of it there. You know, that's an example of contrast here. Here's what I would define as contrast being. Contrast is this idea of varying many different things within your design. This could be the variation in brightness, in texture, in size, color, and shape. Now there are more things that we certainly could vary in there. We could vary color saturation, we could vary color temperature, we could vary color hue, we could get um, a little bit finer pointed when we're talking about these um, different kinds of contrast, but those, that's a good summary of the things that we can contrast when we're designing. So what does this look like when um, Williams describes it? She says, if the elements are not the same, then she says make them very different. And this would probably be something in your notes that I would put really, really strong, uh, you know, stars are highlighting beside because it is such a good concept of design. So many people think that if they go ahead and put a 14 point font next to an 11 point font, that that's created some kind of contrast. And generally speaking, that is a very weak contrast. It's so weak that it almost looks more like a mistake. It looks like someone meant to put 11 point font and accidentally put 14 point font than it does when there's a real contrast, when there's a very different contrast. So William's point here is a really, really good one. I'm going to break down a couple different kinds of contrast. So these would be kind of sub bullet points in your notes underneath the contrast, right? There can be contrast in size. Now, if we look at this individual slide here, it's meant to illustrate our principle that we're talking about here. This point size here for the words contrast in, that is probably four times as small. It's a fourth the size of the word size right there. And so that is a really aggressive use of size contrast. All of these examples that you'll see here have very aggressive contrasts in size, right? Whether it is the huge photograph on this page that contrasts with the much, much larger everything else on this page, whether it is the very, very aggressive illustration that's right in the middle of the page here, and how much larger is that main illustration than everything else on the page? I mean, it's a by order of magnitude, it's probably three or four times larger than the next largest thing, which would be the flag at the top of the page there. Same thing here, this very, very large photograph on the page. As we talked about before, maybe there's a place to re-note um, this in your notes, this idea of a bleed photograph. Do you see how this photograph, because of its very, very tight crop there, it almost appears that it bleeds off the side of the page here. And by doing that, it exaggerates its size even more. So really tight crops on things and then using them as a bleed that um, that makes that thing appear even larger than it is on the page. The second kind of contrast is contrast in shape. And I think that this is such an uh, interesting one to use, especially when you're working with your infographic here, right? So this is a great old page design that I've kept in my lecture for a long time 
because I think it is so excellent. If we go ahead and just look at how this is laid out, we see this really strong vertical line here. We see a very strong vertical line here, a strong vertical line here. So, so much of this page, including the bottom por portion of this bow right here, everything is so vertical. And when it's not vertical, it's very, very horizontal. So we have this discord word, or this over Ben Roya here, or we have the, um, the flag at the top of the page here, and all the folio information is so horizontal. Everything is either vertical or horizontal, except for one element on the page. And by going ahead and having contrast in shape from either horizontal or vertical to the only thing on the page that's going to be diagonal is that broken bow, that's going to bring emphasis to it. And what a smart way of using contrast in shape. Same thing here, right? We have this idea of a very rectangular um, block of copy down here, but it has this little chunk taken out of the side of it. So that contrasts with this very, um, you know, very angular pull quote that's right here. We have this large circle right here, and that large elliptical shape is going to go ahead and contrast with these broken ellipses here as well. So we have this idea of shapes playing against one another. That's a really, really interesting way of designing. Another, the third kind of contrast that we can take on is idea of contrast in texture. So I've added some texture to the word texture down there to give it um, a little bit of a sense of what we're talking about here. I think this is a great example of the um, use of contrast and texture. This entire page, this main centerpiece design right here, the entire thing is laid out in such a flat way, right? These, this typography is flat black, this subhead is flat black, the initial drop cap here is flat black, the jump line is flat black, even the illustration here is very flat. Um, in the way it's presented. But then we have this one item in this centerpiece package that not only has this drop shadow, which gives it the illusion of depth, but it's the only thing on here that's photographic and has the idea of value, right? It has the idea of shade and tint and reflection and highlight and shadow. All of that's happening right here on that one item, and so it contrasts with the rest of the items in this package. I think that's a really smart use of contrast here. The second kind of um, design principle that Williams would like us to remember when we're talking about effective design is this idea of alignment. So this is kind of our second major bullet point here. And boy, we have talked about alignment a lot here, but let's go ahead and kind of put a nice bow on it here. This is the idea of how can we make things look like they are clean and sophisticated, like they were put there with a purpose and that nothing was put there mindlessly. A lot of um, textbooks will call this a resolved design. And what resolved means is it means that it looks like everything on the page is in its place place for a particular purpose and that the designer has given attention to everything and its placement. So there's nothing that you can point to on the page and say, it doesn't look like the designer did that with very much purpose. Instead, everything has been resolved here. So we want our um, design to have this kind of resolved look. So what does William say about this? The quote that she gives us out of the book is, even when aligned items are physically separated one another, there's an invisible line that connects them. And what a great quote to illustrate so many of the examples that we'll look at here and how alignment is going to work with them. We talked a lot about alignment when we were um, working with the uh, resume project. And now we're going to look at it when we're talking about larger page design with more sophisticated aims. It's not just your name and a few qualifications. Now we're talking about ent entire tables of data. So if we look at this, um, al the alignment on this page, let's look at some details of this alignment. So if we look over here on the right hand side, look at how this main headline here is aligned 
with the margin of the page. Well, that was aligned, again, with purpose, and it looks resolved because it lines up right with the outside margin of what we're going for here. So I think that's a very, very smart way of doing that. I also see that everything here on the left-hand side of this particular team has been lined up. I see everything on the left-hand side of this column has been lined up. So everything in each one of these modules has been laid out with a purpose, and each one of these columns has been laid out with a purpose. Why is the white space over on this side of this team's player names? Well, because it is that white space is used to give distance from this team of players to this team of players. And so that is, again, purposeful alignment that um, really helps to make the um, sophisticated look of this page look even more organized. Here's another example. This is one of my favorite examples, not just because I idolize Bob Dylan, but, but also because I think that it's such a smart use of alignment. Why do I like that this use of alignment? One of the reasons that I like this use of alignment is that there are four pictures in each one of these rows, right? One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and so on. It continues all the way down the page. Why do I like the alignment of this? I like the alignment of this because when we get down to the text, which is different, which is meant to be contrasting everything else here, we don't have four columns of text. Now we have three columns of text. So the alignment of these columns, the design of these columns, is meant to break up what was this structure that was happening here. It's meant to make this group of words look um, separate and apart from these um, photos up here. So I think that that's really, really smartly done with its alignment. The other thing that we can note about the alignment here is a little bit more basic, but it's something that is done with a lot of care. All of the photos are aligned at the top. All of the photos are aligned at this side. All of the photos are aligned at this side. All of them are aligned at their bottoms as well. And so what you get from that is you get this very, very orderly look to this um, page. It's not without its creative flourishes. We have this nice sepia tone color down here at the bottom that again breaks up uh, the you know the repetition of what we have going here. So there's some uh, there's some nice creative flourishes here, but we also have a very organized page through its use of alignment. And I think that that's smartly done. Now there are pages that we can look at here, and we can just go a little bit batty with looking at them and saying, well, the designer here clearly had his eye on alignment, had her eye on alignment, but they just made some mistakes. And these are the kinds of things that we want to stare at our own designs for and try to say, how could the alignment have been done better? So I want you to look especially at this, um, this series of screens in the middle of the page here, right? Screens being the idea that these are shaded boxes sitting behind the type. If we look at this entire package of stuff um, in the, striping through the middle of the page there. How do you, how would you give advice to the designer here to ask them to work on the alignment of the page? What would you have them do better or with more care? These are the kinds of things that you should be able to do once you um, are sitting down to critique someone's design. So look at that page. What do you notice about it? There are a couple things that I'm hoping that you notice. One of them is this. If we look at the bottom of the text here, this module right here is telling me the text is going to go very, very far down deep into the module and almost start to escape it at the bottom. But the next one tells me just the opposite. It says, no, in fact, I'm not going to use that space very much. I'm going to use it as negative space. And then the next one tells me something in between, and the next one confuses me even more, and then by the end of it, we get almost back to the same place that we started. 
I think that that's a very ineffective way of using alignment, where all of these could end at the same spot. Maybe this one could be shorter. Maybe this one could be longer. They are all ending at different spots, and I think that that is a very ineffective way of using alignment here. Same thing with um, the horizontal alignment of the text. So if we look at the edge of the circular shape here, it lines up nicely with this um, text box about circle. Very well done. I think that that's a smart way of aligning things. But then we get over to the next one, and the square is very much just protruding maybe a pica off the side of this text box. Well, that seems a little bit clumsy, but maybe not too terrible. But then we get to the next one, and this one seems to be almost triple the amount of space that this one was missing. This one, it's unclear. This one looks like it's almost lined up again. And then this one is protruding just a little bit as well. By the end of this, again, we have this very inconsistent way of aligning the shapes to the text, the text to the, um, to the screens. And you can even say that we have some mistakes here in terms of how wide the columns are. Look how wide this column is, and then look how narrow this column is. Why design those differently? It just seems a little bit lazy. And going back to our original term, it does not look resolved in the way that we hope it would. The other thing that we can say about alignment here is that it can create two different kinds of balance. And there are two different kinds of balance that we should pay attention to when we're designing. One of them is called formal balance, and one of them is called informal balance. I think that you can probably look at those terms and just think about them in general, and you probably have a taste already for which one of them you like. Do you like things very formal and orderly, or do you like things to have motion to them? So um, let's talk about each one of these. Formal balance is basically the idea of a symmetrical design. Now we talked about this going all the way back to um, our photography unit, that when things are centered on the page, that they are static and they have very, very little movement to them. Remember the series of photographs that we looked at earlier, that when things were in the center, we said that they were stationary, almost confrontational, and they're looking at us and saying, I'm not going anywhere, right? And we can see the same thing when we look inside of formal balance designs. One of the most typical places to find this is when you go to, unfortunately, a science fair, right? You remember those trifold boards that each one of you was given when you were doing a science fair project? Well, when you do a science fair project, it seems almost genetically or uh, intrinsically put upon us that we have to do formal design when we do a science fair project. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is, Right in the middle of the science fair project goes the headline, and right down the middle go three photos. And on the sides of those three photos, we have one photo on each side, and then one photo on each side. If we have two graphs, we put one on the left and one on the right. We have three or four observations, methods, conclusions over here. We have a bunch of stuff over here. And basically the thing is evenly weighted right down the middle of the screen here, right? That is an example of formal balance. Same thing with this one with formal balance. We have the same number of bar graphs on either side of this middle axis of the science fair project, right? Same thing here. If we're going to go ahead and have um, things, we're going to line this thing up so that it's almost symmetrical from side to side. When we do this, unfortunately what it does is it just sits there. It doesn't have any particular movement across from left to right, top to bottom. It's just sort of there. So. What's the alternative to that? Well, the alternative is what we've talked about before as like rule of thirds, right? The idea of informal balance. We're trying to here create movement across the page, and we're trying to make things move from left to right or from right to left, and then we're trying to make the reader's eye travel with that. Now, as Western readers, we all generally read from left to right and from top to bottom, and so what we'll see most often when we have this kind of informal balance is we'll see the eye starting to travel from the top left-hand side of the page to the bottom right-hand side of the page. This is a very strong example of 
um, informal bounds. Look at those thousands and thousands of words that the designer here was tasked with laying out, right? How could the designer have laid this out? Well, the designer could have put a bunch of words on this side of the page and a bunch of words on this side of the page and taken this illustration and put it straight down the middle of the page. Well, there's a bunch of reasons not to do that, most of which, one of which is the idea that it would create very formal balance, that we would not have our eye traveling. But instead, with this, we have concentration starting in the top left in a very rule of thirds type location. And then as we keep moving, we move bottom to, to, to the bottom right. The book draws our attention, the pull quote draws our attention, and by doing that, we create that kind of movement. That's a strong way of doing that. Now, designers don't always do that. They don't always take us from top left to bottom right. Sometimes they'll take us from top right and they'll direct us the opposite direction. So this is uh, Bruce Springsteen here and he's uh, directing our attention down into the copy and then we would go ahead and read that copy um, through there. So another example of um, informal balance. It's very, uh, it's not weighted toward the middle. If you look in the middle of the page here, there's really not much going on right here, but we do have very strong things happening on the right and very strong things happening on the left. Same deal here with Shrek, right? We see this idea of um, a very, very strong asymmetrical design. There certainly are things in the middle of the page, but they aren't nearly as visually interesting and as visually vital as what's down in the bottom right hand corner. So this is meant to draw our eye um, down here and have this be the starting spot. This brings us to the idea of literally the idea of an eye line. An eye line being a line that goes across the page and is meant to take us to a specific spot in the page. So I'm going to give you a couple different options of how to define eye lines in your notes. And you should know both of them because they're both useful for when you're laying something out. So the first one, the is um, kind of the root of the definition, which is the idea is that it is literally a band of space that's running across the page. And it's gonna do one of two things, right? The, the thing that, it, that all of these uses of eye line have in common is that it is meant to direct your eye. It's meant as a pathway for your eye to make its way from one part of the page to another part of the page. So this is a one example of an eye line, and that is that there is an uninterrupted space all the way across the page that leads us to the dominant element. In this case, the dominant element is obviously this picture of Will Smith. And so we um, travel between the S and the M. They've given us that space there. We travel across the top of that body copy and we encounter him there. There is no line on the page, right? Nobody actually put this red line on the page, but we can go ahead and see that line um, as being there. Same thing here. This is a second option of an eye line, and it is um, a, a line that encounters nothing as it travels across the page. It travels all the way through that subhead line that's right there, and it's not going to really encounter anything. I think that some people could argue that you are indeed encountering part of that graphic by doing it, but it's really not a substantial part. The two ideas of eye line are one, that it encounters the dominant element, and second, that it doesn't really encounter anything. So let's look at some of these playing out as examples here. So this is a, uh, a magazine layout from a few years ago, right? Can you locate the eye line on this page? the place where if you travel through the page, it takes us to an important part of the page, but it doesn't encounter anything along the way. Well, I think it's really easy to see exactly where this goes. Now, there is really no way that we can um, look at magazine spreads this way and say, oh, that just happened by accident. This is a very intentional visual thing that is meant to take us to the most important part of the photograph, which is right through Donald Trump's nose here. And that's what they'd like us to do to encounter that part of the face naturally 
through a line that they've created here. Sometimes this doesn't have to be strictly a linear line, right? This is kind of a flowing line that takes us across the page. But notice this it really is almost completely uninterrupted. Although it kind of swerves and jigs and jogs there, that red line takes us almost completely through the page and um, that pattern really never leaves the red line except for one little instance along the right hand side there. So eye lines are one way to uh, do this. So. We've now talked about a couple different things. We've talked about contrast. We've talked about alignment. It's time for number three. Three is this idea of repetition. And what Williams would say about repetition, it is, is our third important design principle here, right? And so I'm gonna give you two different kinds of repetition, which I think are useful to think about. And one of them is that we can repeat things by being consistent. So this is kind of like when you're writing an essay that you use the same word over and over again to re-instill um, in the reader what exactly it is you want them to take away from it. The second one is that you can use the same shapes and forms. This would be like if you're writing an essay that you use the same sentence structure over and over again to rhetorically give people the idea that this is the same essay with the same meaning to it. Repetition through consistent page elements. What does this look like, right? This is certain elements of the page remaining unchanged. So we, we had an entire lecture when we were looking at the front page of that newspaper and when we were looking at the Nicki Minaj magazine spread and we were talking about consistent page elements on the page, on the spread. We were talking about uh, jump lines, we were talking about subheads, we were talking about bylines, we were talking about captions and photo credits. These are the things that we're talking about. Things that remain consistent all the way through. So what does this look like? When we look at front pages like this one from the Wichita Eagle, take a look at these things that are repeated. Here's a byline here, and a byline here, and a byline here, and a byline here. These four bylines are using the exact same structure every time. They're being very, very consistent here. The same thing here for this um, this subhead that's sitting up above the main headline, and you can see that it's um, in this light gray weight, this light gray weight, this light gray weight. We're gonna use those things over and over again, consistently styling them that particular way. We can see other items on this page that are consistently uh, laid out as well. For instance, we see these bottom three headlines are all using the same headline font, right? The same serifed headline font all the way through. So that is another example of consistent page elements. If we look here, even something like this headshot, this mugshot that's sitting here, and these two mugshots that are sitting down here, and this one right here that's nested in there, these things are all consistently sized, so that would be another example of consistent page elements too. Another way that we can do this is through consistent shape and forms, through repetition of shape and forms. I think that this is very similar to what we were talking about with photography when we said go ahead and have the same thing in your photograph over and over and over again, but then have something break that repetition, right? So I think that repetition's great, but it's also really, really nicely done when it is broken. So an example of that from this past one is, we're gonna use the exact same headline fonts all the way through our page, except when we don't. And so this top one here is going to use a different weight, a different font family, a different styling altogether, and that's going to bring emphasis to that top one. What other example can we use? We can use this one. We see the same size and shape of all of these over and over and over again. Everything is square and aligned exactly like this. And then over here, this entire package is not square. We have this entire package right here as being much more vertical. And so that creates um, emphasis on that uh, package as well. I think this is one of the more, more clever page designs that we have as part of this lecture. I think it's really, really smartly done. Look at this, um, this story package up here. 
the drop cap, the drop cap, the sub, the the byline, the byline, the subhead, the subhead, the body copy, the body copy. Everything, even the jump line, is styled the same, and at the same time, they are made to be very, very different. This one has a white background to it, and this one has this honey solid gold, this honey background to it. And you would think, well, that would make the page very, very divided. But look at this one little design touch that they have down here. This one little drop of honey helps to unite these things together. So we have this idea of very similar repeated things, very similar repeated things. This right here and this right here, we could almost just copy and paste this into InDesign, but then we go ahead and we just change one little thing about it and it brings emphasis to it. So a nice job of repetition that is broken here. Probably no better example than this one though, where we have so many repeated forms. Everything is very angular and very sharp edged all the way through this design, even down to the typography is very angular and sharp edged and very, very modular. And then the only thing that's gonna break that, it's not the body copy, it's not the drop cap, it's not the byline, it's not the subheads, it's this one thing, look at this. Down here, we have this one curved bit of text down there, and that's gonna be the thing that's gonna break that repetition. I think that that's very, very elegantly done there. And then the final one that Williams will bring up to us of CARP is proximity. And again, this is stolen or at least borrowed from the idea that um, Gestalt gives us about Gestalt grouping. And um, what proximity is, is very simple, right? Is that related items should share space. That when we want things to be related, we give them um, the certain, uh, same amount of spacing and less spacing as well. William says, this helps organize information, reduces clutter, and gives the reader a clear structure. So speaking of clear structure, there's probably no better example in our lecture than the slide that we're about to see here, right? So just remember this idea from Williams. This helps organize information, reduces clutter, and gives the reader a clear structure. So look at this clear structure on this next page. This next page is so, so smart about how it uses structure. So this entire package here, all the way around the edges of this page right here, this is all meant, these 12 boxes are all meant to be together. And one of the reasons that we know this is because there's a consistency of color, right? There's a repetition of color. Like we just talked about for the R of CARP, there's a repetition of color, right? We also can see it because of the way that things are aligned, right? That the idea that all of these things are aligned with a very, very um, strong intention around the outside of them, that is very clearly something that holds them together. But the other thing that holds them together is proximity. There is literally no space between this mustard color square right here and this blue colored square. They've given us no internal margin no internal margin between any of these squares in here, right? And that holds them together as a very, very tight set of um, squares so that we understand that they're together. And you might say, well, that's obvious, right? But now look down here at the bottom. Here are some more of these colored shapes. And these colored shapes down here, they do have a little bit of space in between them. Now, not very much space, but a little bit of space, right? And so we understand that A, B, and C, these things all belong together, not as much as these things belong together, but they belong together. And then we look over here at this side, and there's another rectangle. Well, this rectangle isn't colored in the same way, and look at how much space it has as opposed to this one. It has just a little bit more space between it and dining than dining and music have between them. Why? Because dining and this thing over here aren't as related. So what the um, designer has done here is something that I would have you put in your notes, and it's the idea of levels of white space, right? At the top, we have zero for the levels of white space. That speaks to a very, very close connection. 
down at the bottom left, we have a little bit of white space. That speaks of a connection, but maybe not an incredibly close connection. And then the next level of white space would be this one right here, and this would be a loose connection. Yes, these things are part of the same newspaper, they're part of the same section of the newspaper, but they aren't related in terms of their topic. So spacing did all of that for us, right? So we have to be really, really mindful of proximity, right? I like this one a lot, the idea that we're going to use very consistent internal margins all the way through here, and that these things are clearly more related to one another because they are spaced close than this uh, photo right here is related to that because they are farther away. Now these um, these lines right here, these rules that run throughout the page, those are um, those are hints at proximity, if you will. They kind of uh, they use closure to hold things together. Uh, but proximity does a lot of the work here as well. We can see this a lot when we look at uh, more modern pages like this, more contemporary pages like this. And one of the things that we can start seeing here is um, the last level of white space that you can get in your notes, and that's the idea of overlapping white space, right? That we no not only give a certain amount of white space between thing A and thing B, but that we actually give a negative amount of white space between thing B and thing C. By doing that, we're making that um, relationship crystal clear that those things belong together. It's even stronger than if they're just basic, barely touching. It's the idea that they're inextricably linked and people will group them together. So that's C-A-R-P, right? How do we know this when we look back at those newspaper design redesigned pages that we saw. So go ahead and take a look at some more pairings of these and tell me which one is more effective design. So we have design on the left, we have design on the right. Which one is the redesign and how can you tell that it's a better design? Well, to me, the answer is clear that the one on the left is the better design. It's the more recent redesign and so um, what were they trying to do here? Well, if I was breaking this down in a critique, I would say that this is a much more effective use of contrast because the contrast in size between the largest thing on the page and everything else on the page is very, very aggressive. That the typography here also makes it very clear what the headline is and that the subhead is less important. The use of proximity here is very, very strong, that I'm able to read the headline and go right to the subhead. As a contrast, the headline over here is very distant in proximity from the subhead, and that to me is a less effective way of doing it. I also appreciate the levels of spacing that are here and how, um, how nuanced they are. For instance, this amount of space right here and this amount of space right here, those are nicely, uh, those are nicely laid out. And that these two are, are assumed to be more related than the literature one over here, that this, uh, that this rule and this space here is trying to hold it out as different. So I like the idea of how proximity is used here as well. Alignment is also strongly um, done here. The idea that everything lines up with this left edge of the page here, I think that that is uh, well done as well. Whereas we go over here to this page, we see that there's one kind of alignment, another kind of alignment, another kind of alignment. We're using so many different kinds of alignment on the page, including this one up here, that we're gonna just, um, it's gonna be a less clean um, look at how to design the page. Another example here of before and after, which one of these would you prefer as a reader of this newspaper? I would prefer the one on the right, which is indeed uh, the redesign. How could you, as um, a critiquer of design, talk about this in terms of CARP? This is the kind of thing that could very, very easily wander onto an exam or wander into your life as um, you are working at a publication. Which one of these designs do you like for tomorrow's front page? Which kind of design do you like for our annual report? 
Um, which kind of design do you like for our newspaper front page? Which one is best, right? So um, that's the, those are the things that I'm hoping that you'll take away. Um, and um, as a practice for this, as a way to study for the exam, um, why don't you take a look at this final page here. There are lots and lots of things that I think are problematic about this page. And as practice for the exam, as a way of exercising the ideas that we just talked about with CARP, think about how this page could be improved. This is the Montgomery County Sentinel. So this is a professional uh, newspaper. It is almost, uh, you know, it's it's eight years old here. So we're, we're critiquing something that's very dated. But what would you go ahead and critique about this spread? I'm gonna go ahead and pause for a second here. I want you to pause your lecture if you would. And I want you to take a uh, few minutes, maybe five or 10 minutes, to write out your answer in the form of a paragraph and see what you come up with. And then I'll revisit with you in a moment here. Um, and you can unpause whenever you're ready and I'll give you some of the critique things that I would say about this. I think perhaps the most startling problem with this page here that needs to be corrected is the idea that this um, story right here, the brick, Brickyard Battle Continues, County Moves Ahead While Some Complaint About Property Use, because of its proximity to this photograph, it looks like the Brickyard Battle Continues refers to this photograph. They are linked by proximity. They're linked by alignment. They're aligned with one another, right? They are um, linked in so many ways that we assume that they're together. Well, they don't have anything to do with one another. The only thing that they have to do with one another is that they're in the same issue of the paper. This story is actually happening later in the paper. So this to me is a problem of proximity proximity and a problem of alignment. I think another problem that I have with this um, page in terms of my critique of it would be a, a problem of repetition. The repetition of green here could be seen as a strong repetition except for the fact that they never actually match, right? The color hue that we're using here is the same because it's green, but the, um, the actual uh, saturation of the color changes and that makes it um, not create any sort of uh, interesting contrast but instead it makes it conflict. Speaking of conflicting colors this red over here that has tons and tons of saturation and then this oh boy gradient red down at the bottom of this screen right here makes it even more uh, problematic, should we say, right? So this is a, this is a really big uh, problem that we run into. Another problem uh, we could see here would be this idea of proximity with the headline. We actually have more space in between the lines of this headline than we do between um, you know the headline and the subhead itself. So this is meant to stick together, but it's almost separating itself because it has more space than the subhead does be between the, um, itself and the headline. So that could be another uh, point that, I, that you could uh, bring out here. I do think that you could give this um, newspaper some credit. I like the idea that the Sentinel here has a very, very strong contrast with the idea of the Montgomery County font family that was chosen. I think that that is smartly done. I'm not sure though about this idea of going with a third variation um, underneath here. Is that the best way of doing it? Probably, uh, probably not. Another tip that I would give to our designers here is uh, this um, this stroke that's all the way around our folio information. Is that necessary? Is there a better way to do that? It's certainly not necessary to do it around the price of gas. And oh boy, the gradient within here is problematic, especially with uh, the alignment that's used here. Look how tight this text is 
toward this box that it's sitting in. Shouldn't we have a little bit of relief considering how much open white space we have over there? These are things that would make this page look more resolved, and these are things that hopefully you're geared up to write about and to talk about now that you know about William's ideas of what she calls C-A-R-P. That's it for today. Um, hope that was a good lecture for you, and I will talk to you next time when we talk about some photography.